6 verses 1 through 5. This is going to be the next section. I told pastor, I said I just couldn't get away from this next uh, contextual unit because it was just... Uh, it just, it just so occupied my mind and intrigued me, and I kept going back to it, thinking about it. We need to have a proper attitude about work. And this passage talks about this issue. I, uh, Pastor, I told Heidi, I said I was really struggling. I said I need to rein myself in and just focus on just this passage because that's what the message is, this passage. But I'm wanting to bring in, I found myself meditating on all these different passages that talk about work, even about creation and Adam and the nature of uh, the, his situation. Just throw this out there. Have you ever considered that when God created the ideal world and he created Adam, the first thing he did was give him a job? And not only was it a job, but it was a job without end. He said, tend the garden. That wasn't, you know, stack those bricks where you see an end. This was going to occupy him at this point, ideally, for eternity. God said, Adam, you're a farmer. <laughs> That's what you're going to do. <laughs> that was his first job. And apparently in the creation, he taught him how to do it. <laughs> so, anyway. All right. I said I was going to rein myself in, so I'm doing that now. All right. I'm going to read the passage, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. I'm going to cover this passage out of order. It begins with a natural illustration. Then it talks about the, you know, which provides the answer to the problem. It, then it, you know, provides a natural illustration. Then it talks about wrong behavior, and then it talks about the results of the wrong behavior. So I'm going to, I'm going to cover the problem, the results of the problem, and the correction to the problem in that order. So we'll come to the natural illustration last in our message instead of first. The first thing I want you to notice here is the problem with this individual called the sluggard, which just means a lazy person, is, is laziness. But it, it's a laziness that has a love of leisure, of relaxation. When I read this passage, and, he, and in verse 10 it says, Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. This sounded like a poetic repetition. But when I studied it and got into the language, it's actually a progressive series of actions. The word translated a little, these three times, is a little more. You know, it can be understood, a little more. So the picture it presents is, the first thing you have is the person has slept, then they sleep a little bit more. Then they wake up again. But this second time, translated a little slumber, now you see they've had enough rest. Their body doesn't need to sleep anymore at this point. And so what they do now is they just doze. This word translated slumber, the English word slumber, and the underlying Hebrew word mean the same thing. That is to sleep lightly. Just dozing, kind of an in and out. So he's gone beyond the point of getting a night's adequate sleep. He, he wakes up after his six to eight hours and he goes, oh, I still want to sleep. So he closes his eyes and he goes back to sleep. Maybe he sleeps another hour or so. 
Then he wakes up, and he's like, oh, I don't want to get out of bed. So he tries to go back to sleep, and he starts to doze, and then he kind of comes to and goes back in, back out, back in. And then finally, he can't even do that anymore. And so he rolls onto his back, and he does this. And he just lays there with his eyes closed and his hands folded. He's no longer actually sleeping. He's, this word translated in English, sleep, is just to lie down. He's just lying there. You don't fold your hands on your side. He's laying on his back with his hands on his chest or his belly, with his eyes closed, just laying there because he doesn't want to get out of bed. Sometimes hardships come on people through no fault of their own. My brother lives in Southern California, and he shared a picture of all these homes that were wiped out by the fires, and about an elderly couple that tried to hide from the fire in their pool, and the wife died. She suffocated, because you, know, you can't stay under the water, so they kept coming up, and she basically suffocated on the hot, smoky air. He survived, she died. Another couple actually made it through the fire by doing the exact same thing, staying in their pool. And they didn't do anything wrong. This was a calamity that came on them. But sometimes hardships come on people because of a series of bad choices. I want you to notice something here. This is, this is a progressive action. This is progressive. This isn't a one-time thing. This is a determined reluctance to get out of bed when it is the right time to get out of bed and get to work. He wants to relax. He wants to be at leisure. And God here is warning this person about what's coming. He says, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. The word translated here, traveleth, is walking. So it's not an instantaneous thing. God isn't saying you skip a day's work and bam, he's going to take everything you have. What he is saying is that if you continue in a progressive pattern of shirking your responsibilities and loving leisure over work, it's going to come. Poverty is going to come. And then it says, thy want as an armed man. So it's, it's going to be against your will. It's going, you know, it may be gradual. It may take time, but eventually, if you sustain this practice of laziness, what's going to happen is you are going to lose what you have, even against your will. Like an armed man, you know, armed men raiding the city and robbing the residents, so your laziness will take what you have. I found it necessary to talk about the term poverty because it is not being used in the same way in common English now. It is not being used in the same way that the Bible uses it. Perhaps you have a correct understanding of what poverty is. Or perhaps you have adopted what the world is currently saying poverty is. I'm going, I had long suspected reading news articles and such that the world didn't mean the same thing by poverty that I did. Because they, according to them, I have my entire life existed in a state of poverty. If you go by their numbers and such, I have always lived in poverty. And my family is currently, um, we would have to more than double our income to get out of poverty for our, according to these people. Which, 
I looked at Heidi. I was like, what would we do with all that money? <laughs> because we, 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 we've had people, they, they'll ask, they'll say, do you guys need anything? And we're like, not right now. We're good. What I discovered was that the world uses poverty in two ways. The first way is the old meaning of poverty, and they don't use it that way much anymore. And they don't tell you when they're switching uses. Normally, they use it the second way. And they kind of an inclusive. They, it's the second way, but it includes the first way, of course. The first definition is they call it, they have termed it absolute poverty. And I'm going to read to you according to their own words. Absolute poverty is synonymous with destitution and occurs when people cannot obtain adequate resources measured in terms of calories of nutrition or uh, of calories or nutrition to support a minimum level of physical health. So that is absolute poverty is you don't have enough food to keep from dying eventually. The second meaning that the world has adopted for poverty is relative part poverty, and that's where I fall under. Relative poverty occurs when people do not enjoy a certain minimum level of living standards as determined by a government and enjoyed by the bulk of the population that vary from country to country, sometimes within the same country. Did you hear that? We're not talking about people, relative poverty, when they say, you know, when they use relative poverty, and they normally don't say it that way, they just say poverty. People are poor, living in poverty. They are not saying they are without food and water. They're not saying that they're without housing or clothing. They're saying that they don't, that they don't live at the same standard as the average person in the country does. Now, that's how the world defines it. Let's look at what the Bible says. If you were to look at the definitions of poverty, both in the word poverty, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, really it's not very illuminating because it just means to lack. That is the idea. So if you are poor, that means you are in a state of lacking. So that doesn't really answer the question, what does that mean? What are you lacking? Are you lacking a Maserati? Does that make you poor? <laughs> lacking a Bugatti? Or any of these other uh, Italian named cars? Well, luckily the Bible elsewhere states it positively at what level you're not poor. You're not lacking. In Titus chapter 6, uh, not Titus, 1 Timothy, sorry, it's really small print. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 8 reads, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So, if you have enough food and water to maintain your life, and the means to protect yourself from the elements, that's good. And you don't need more than that. If you have more than that, that is called prosperity. <laughs> so the Bible, I'm not trying to step on anyone's toes, but the Bible only recognizes, of those two definitions that the world listed previously, the Bible only recognizes one of them, and that's absolute poverty. The Bible doesn't say anything about if you have less than someone else, if you have more than you need to survive. It is okay for you to have less than your neighbor. I had a, a friend who is wheelchair bound. And he asked me one day, he said, how come you get along better with me than other people seem to be uncomfortable with me? 
why not you? And I said, I didn't put you in the wheelchair. Not my fault. It's between you and God. I said, if you want my help, I'll help you. I said, but I'm not going to feel bad about the fact that I can walk and you can't. I said, that'd be like me being mad about the birds being able to fly and I can't fly. Or more apropos to me, because growing up I wouldn't stay out of the water. My mom got me into swim lessons because I three times almost drowned because I would not stay out of the water. First time was at a barbecue, the person had a pool, I was a very little guy. I ran, jumped in, went under. Dad pulled me out. Second time was at the beach. Uh, if you've ever been on the West Coast, they have these rock jetties. They pile up these rocks in a big, big giant rocks in a big line. And then they dump concrete into them to hold them together. I think it has something to do to help the tides from being too rough or something. All I knew that we used them for was you walk out to the end and go fishing. <laughs> That's all I ever saw people use them for. And so we were walking out, and we got really far. Like, they go out quite a bit. And I was like, hey, I'm going to get in the water. I was still a little guy, and I jumped off. And I hit the water, and I went under. And I remember I couldn't see because it was dark. The, wa the water was dark. And then I felt something grab me and yank me out. And the third time was at a public swimming pool. I was the youngest in my family. My older brother and my older sister and their friends were in the deep end. And I was in the kiddie pool. And I didn't have any friends with me. And I got tired of that. So I climbed out of the pool, went over by the deep end where it was 10 feet deep, and jumped off. And I went under. So my mom said, that's it. Glenn, he has to have swim lessons or he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so you couldn't keep me out of the water when I was growing up. This is... a. This is like a, the longest period of my life that I've gone without regularly being in the water. <laughs> Till I was 22, I never lived more than a couple of miles from the ocean. You know? Loved the ocean, loved the water. And uh, so, you know, that would be like me being mad at the fish. How come you get to be in the water all day and I don't? How come I go under the water and stay? I die. You're fine. Or the, or the whales, the dolphins. It's ridiculous. God gives more to some, gives less. If he's meeting your food needs and he's giving you the means to get out of the elements, the Bible says, be content. You have what you need. More than that is prosperity. So the Bible does not recognize relative poverty. It only recognizes absolute poverty. So this is the problem. The person, we're not talking about getting good rest. This is more rest than is needful. This is resting when you, you know, you're shirking other responsibilities to get more rest. Leisure when you should be laboring. What ought you to be doing? And it uses an interesting illustration to me. When I, when I first read it, I just kind of glossed over it, but then I, studying it, reflecting on it, a lot of things came out, became curious as to, to this. So he says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. So examine the ant. And the first thing it says, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. So without leadership. Um, I have become convinced that though in English we have three things listed, it's actually talking about one thing that produces, that performs two jobs. Because the first word is a noun and the second two are participles. So that would be like saying... Um, which having no guide, overseeing, or ruling, turn it into a verbal noun and you'll get the impact more. So when you look at leadership, leadership provides two basic functions. 
assign the goals, and maintain accountability. Tell them what you're supposed to do, and then they check up on you to make sure you're maintaining productivity and meeting those goals. That is the two basic functions of leadership, especially in a work environment. Establish goals, maintain accountability. And that's what these words mean, the overseeing and the ruling. So the ants says the ants don't have someone telling them these are your goals and this is your productivity rate. Make sure that when I come and check on you next week that you've kept up that level of productivity. The ant doesn't have that. The ants have a queen, but she isn't ruling. She's busy having babies. So the ants just go out and do their job. The second thing I noticed was in verse 8. I found myself wondering, why just two seasons mentioned? I had never spent a lot of time reading about ants. It's only two seasons mentioned, summer and harvest. Nothing about spring, nothing about winter, just summer and harvest. So that's summer and fall. So I started reading about ants. And I discovered something. Ants are cold-blooded, very sensitive to the temperature. You're not going to see very many ants about right now. Because ants, on average, most breeds of ants, don't tolerate very well temperatures below 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And so when it gets steady, cooler than that, they retreat to their colonies. They stay in their colonies until it warms up. So they only work outside of the colony half the year. Second thing about the nature of their work is I, I found it interesting what I just told you about leadership, established goals, and uh, hold accountability is that the um, provideth her meat in the summer, that is to make ready. Um, you may not know this, but the word provide originally meant to, to foretell something, to see it, to predict it, to see it beforehand. It means literally to see before. Pro, uh, provide is from the Latin. Pro meaning before, and then the vide is from the verb vedere, to see. You know the video store? That always cracked me up because video means I see. What's worse is Volvo. Volvo is Latin for I roll over. <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to drive a Volvo. <laughs> That's where we get the word revolve and involve. So it means to, to make ready. It's often translated that way. So the ants during the summer, when they come out of their colony, they have to find and establish good food sources where the seeds are. They eat mostly seeds, apparently. Go find the good so food sources. And then, after they have established where the good food is, the person who finds the good food, they lay a chemical trail that the other ants can find, and they follow it, and they gather that food and bring it back to the colony. Now, think about that. They're only, without the benefit of, of organization, just instinct, they are able to provide for themselves and the entire colony only working half the year. But you want to know something? Not all of the ants are gathering food. So it's not like everybody's getting their winter supply. The queen doesn't go out and gather food. She has to be provided for. The larvae, they don't provide for themselves. They have, the gatherers have to bring them food. Then there are ants dedicated to the care of the queen and the larvae. They don't go out and gather food. The gatherers have to bring their food. Then there are ants that see to the maintenance of the tunnels. They don't go out and gather food. So the gatherers have to bring in their food. And then, I found this fascinating that God put this into the ant to understand this. 
Mini ants. Um, you, have you pulled up the picture of the ant over here? <laughs> Do you see that? Ants don't eat leaves. You know what it's doing? It's taking the leaf to the colony so it can rot and produce an exothermic reaction and maintain the temperature of the colony. So a portion of the population of the colony, they aren't gathering food. They're gathering vegetation to maintain the warmth of the colony during the winter months. So that's a lot of different ants that aren't gathering food at all. Only a, a relatively small portion of the total population is gathering food and only during half the year. And yet they are able to gather everything they need. The reason I'm bringing all this out is the, the complaint I hear about people who are constantly trying to avoid work is, what's the point of living if I have to work all the time? You don't have to work all the time. <laughs> it's built into the system that you can actually provide for your needs and some prosperity items fairly easily. Does anyone here know? I want to share some things with you. Um, let me back up a step. All wealth begins with food production. Because if you do not have a surplus of food, that means everyone is involved in food production. So to have the carpenter, you have to have an excess food supply. To have the teacher, you have to have more food. To have a doctor, you have to have more food. To have the musician, the artist, the craftsman of various types, you have to have a surplus food production of a large enough yield that you can have specialized occupations. It's built in the system that God created that this happens. Does anyone here know how many apples the average apple tree produces in one year? 567. How many kernels of corn? Think about it. You plant one seed, tend it, it will grow into a tree that per year on average will produce 567 apples. I do not eat 567 apples in one year. I don't eat apples that often, unless they're part of something else, like apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, apples, a lot, eating a lot of raw apples make my belly ache. I asked my doctor about it. He said some people have a hard time with raw vegetable matter. They get what's called dietary distress. I'm one of those people. If I eat too much raw vegetables, I, I get the stomach cramps. It hurts. I like them. I just can't eat them a lot. So, but I love cooked vegetables. So the average apple tree, plant one tiny seed. The apple produces lots of seeds. One apple does. Plant it, tend it, and when it's full grown, it will produce on average 567 apples per year. Way beyond, you know, the bare minimum. <laughs> this, is, this is a huge surplus. One kernel of corn, you plant it, it produces a stock. Normally that stock will produce two ears of corn. Any idea with an average stock of corn, how many kernels it's going to produce for one harvest? Any guesses? 1,600. One stock. And I had a farmer tell me that with modern farming methods, with GPS technology, GPS technology has greatly helped them because they can do their planting a lot more accurately. He said they can plant them one inch apart. 
The number for wheat, I didn't include it. I don't have it memorized. But I, re- I, I just looked at it. I was like, okay, that's ridiculous. All they had was the per acre. And the kernels of wheat produced per acre is in the 80-something thousand range. Per acre. There's um, 100 and... Let me think here. Uh, there's 120, there's 640 acres per square mile. 640 acres per square mile. Multiply that by the 80-something thousand kernels of wheat, and you'll get an idea of what Kansas is doing. So God has put into the system that there is an abundant yield for our labor. You don't have to work all the time. You know what? I, I work in the trucking industry, at least on the, uh, the, um, the logistics side of it. I, my job, they, it's officially entitled security guard. No, I don't do security work. I don't do any security work. What I do is I facilitate the picking up and the delivering of loads. That's what I do. I do a lot of computer work. I do a lot of uh, in, um, talking on the radio and the phone with carriers, with warehouse employees, with, car- uh, with drivers. That's what I do. And I talk to these drivers. And trucking is an industry where when you first get into it, you're going to have to put your dues in first. And that first year or two, you're not going to make hardly anything. But if you keep your nose clean, don't get any tickets, after a year or two, you're going to be able to start demanding higher pay. And the carriers are going to actually start contacting you and bidding for your services. And there are guys who brag about making, you know, talk to me about making six-figure salaries as a truck driver. And then those are the guys, though, that really go after the money, really go after the money. But there are a lot of guys that love running dedicated runs. They, 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 basically what they do is they, hi- they haul rail containers between here in Chicago and back all day long. That's what they do. They just run back and forth. And those guys still make a good amount of money. When I hear the, the guys who have to work all the time, they don't have to work all the time. They're choosing to because they're chasing the money. They want to make as much money as they can. Um, the government recently passed some laws to help protect truck drivers. Uh, it's called an electronic log. It's required by law. All trucks have to have it. It keeps track electronic, electronically how often they're driving. It's actually a, hooked up to their engine. So if they engage the engine, it starts ticking off. And this is actually to protect them so that they can't be pressured by their employers to lie about how often, how many hours they've been driving. But I've heard a lot of drivers complaining about the electronic log because they can't lie. Because they want to lie so they can squeeze in another load to make another $1,000 or what have you. That's absolutely foolish. So it's not that they have to work so much because the job doesn't pay enough. Once they get past that first year or two, they're making decent money. Those who work a ton and stay on the road forever are chasing the dollar. They're trying to maximize their profits. The ones who are family guys, once they've put in enough time, they got a little bit of seniority, they can tell the trucking company, get me on a dedicated run or I'm going to another company. So once they get on a dedicated run, they go home every day. God has built into the system that needs are actually easy to meet. I'm not saying that there aren't people out there who aren't able to meet their needs. But that isn't the average situation. Um, There's part of Ethiopia because Ethiopia is a landlocked nation, 
and the nature of the air flows and mountains and such, there's parts of Ethiopia that are very arid, that's dry, very dry. And in those parts of Ethiopia, they're experiencing famine, that is, unable to grow enough food to sustain themselves. Those people need help. That's not what we're talking about. That's not the average situation in the world. The average situation is your labor will produce more than it takes to meet. And, and what are we supposed to be content with? What do we need? Enough food and water to sustain your life and the ability to protect yourself from the elements. That's it. Anything above that is prosperity. How much prosperity then, if you understand that, how much prosperity do you have? I have to say, I have lots of prosperity. I'm, I have hundreds of books of physical copies. I have thousands of books and electronic copies. We have plenty of food. Um, we have the ability to pick up entertainment things. Um, we get movies. We go. We we hit Walmart and buy the you know rummage through the five dollar bin, pick up movies and what have you. So we feel that we are prospering greatly. So the idea isn't that this is an individual rebelling against the fact that they have to work from the moment they wake up until they crash and fall asleep in the dark of the night and they're barely getting by. This is the person who says, I, I don't want to work. I don't want to labor. Look at the ant. The ant works half the year, a fraction of the colony's population, just a fraction, not the whole colony, just a fraction, works half the year and is able to sustain the entire colony for a year. God has built into the system a natural prosperity. But you have to avoid this attitude that work is bad. Reflect back on what I said at the beginning about Adam. When God created the world and he set things up in the ideal way, the first thing he did was give Adam a job to do. This is a perfect man in a perfect world. And God, the, one of the first things he tells him to do is, Adam, get to work. <laughs> and he sets him a task. Remember, Adam isn't going to grow old. He isn't going to become infirm and retire. That happens after the fall. At this point, he's just going to keep living. And God sets him a task that doesn't end. He doesn't say, go build a house. He says, tend the garden. That's going to require labor every day. <laughs> now, it got harder after the fall. But it still would have been there. The leaves still would have been falling. The fruit would have still gotten ripe, had to be harvested. All of these things would still have to be taken care of. So he gave him endless work. My point is that God did not design the world with the goal in mind that you would not work. When you look at Israel and how God set up Israel... He, defy, he divided the human lifespan into three tasks. Learn, labor, and lead. The child is to learn and prepare for adulthood. The adult, which the Bible establishes at 20, at least in Israel, God put adulthood at 20. So I've told my children, I said, because... They, they asked, they said, are you always going to be telling me what to do? And I said, no, I'm not. I said, our relationship's going to change. I said, there's going to be, come a point where you are responsible before God and man for the things you say and do. I said, when you're 20? I said, I'm not going to tell you a thing to do. I'll give you advice. I might offer you my opinion and say, I think that's a bad idea. But I'm not going to give you orders anymore. 
you're a man, you're an adult. 20 years old. So up to that point, the responsibility when God set up Israel, the responsibility of the child was to grow and learn, prepare for adulthood. Once they turned 20, they were to start laboring. Why? What did God tell the man who was saved from thievery? He said, work with your hands that you may provide for yourself and give to others. God built prosperity in the system on average because there will be, especially you know, in our fallen world, there will be circumstances where people can't take care of themselves. Christian, I'm against socialism, but charity is a God-ordained thing. If you know someone who can't provide for themselves and God has prospered you, one of the reasons that he told the thief to labor was so that he could meet that person's need. God did not intend for all of your prosperity to go into your mouth. He intended for to use at least part of that prosperity to aid those who were unable to meet their own needs. God has built prosperity into the system. So you labor, you work, you provide for your needs, you prosper, and you take some of that prosperity and you help those who can't, either through circumstances or through infirmity. They are not able to meet their needs, and you enable them to, to live. Now, then the leader role. There are too many Christians, and I hope I'm not offending people here because I did not my goal, but I want you to understand we need to abandon this idea that there's going to be a time where I don't have to work anymore. That is not part of God's program. There may be a point where you can't earn anymore, but when you reach your elder years, you know what God told the elder in Israel? He said, okay, now you get to retire from the actual providing the actual labor, now your job is to give guidance to the young. The older Christian woman is to tell the young mother to help her understand how to love her children and her husband and to care for her family. The older man is to give guidance to the younger men so that they know how to live. And what to do to give oversight and guidance to pass on. Pastor, you've accumulated a huge wealth of biblical understanding. You've reached the point in your life where God's principal task for you is to pass that on. So that it's not lost when, you, when he gathers you unto himself. If you're a child, you got a job. Playing isn't it. Now, playing, rest time is not wasted time. We're not talking about that. But life is not to be given over to leisure. The child has a job. That is to prepare for adulthood, to learn what their elders are teaching them, to master those skills so that they can grow up and be a productive member of society. If you are an adult, God's plan for you is not for you to hoard your money so that you can quit your job and move to Florida and play golf for the next couple of decades before you die. Not God's plan. God's plan is for you to labor, to provide for yourself, and on average you are going to prosper, so you're going to have money beyond your basic needs. And he says to take part of those resources and help those who can't. And the elder, like I already said, when you reach your years through your advanced years and in infirmity that you can't work like you used to, 
This is God calling you to a new role, a role of leadership and guidance, helping the younger ones so that they know how to live their lives before God and men, to God's honor and glory. It works. It's the system God built. This is his ideal system. Don't hate work. You know, I read a lot of old books, and you'd read the men expressing pride in a thing well done. I saw a portrait done of Paul Revere. Um, You've heard the term masterpiece? That used to actually mean something. That had a technical meaning. A craftsman... When he's a a boy that he's old enough that he can understand instruction and follow orders, he would be apprenticed to a master craftsman. And he'd be at first given lots of small tasks, but those tasks would increase in complexity and responsibility as he grew older. Then at a certain point, when he started to get his adult size on him, he would be advanced to the rank of journeyman in whatever his his craft was. Then he would come to the point where he wanted to become a master, where he no longer had to be under another craftsman, but he could open up his own shop and produce his own wares. And one of the things he had to do was he had to produce his master Peace. This was showing that he had mastered the skills of his trade. And Paul Revere's masterpiece was a teapot, a silver teapot. And I was looking at that portrait, and I could see the pride of a job well done in his face. The, the artist had captured it well. And it was a beautiful silver teapot. He was, he was trained as a silversmith. He later in life advanced into other metalworking, and he, he built a very prosperous uh, company um, plating the keels of ships with uh, metal, casting bronze cannons and such during the Revolutionary War and such. He became a very prosperous businessman. Read this years ago. But he, uh, this portrait shows him holding that teapot up. And you can see the pride of a job well done. And and I read that sort of attitude in a lot of the old books. Craftsmen and laborers who who had pride in their work took pride in a job well done. I knew a man who, uh, who spoke poorly of his position in life because he was a custodian. His job was to clean. And I said, sir, I want to thank you for being a custodian. I want to thank you for being conscientious and attentive to your work. He's looking at me. And I was like, no, I am serious. Who here wants to live in a world where nothing is ever cleaned up? No, thank you. I have many books about the Middle Ages. I don't want diphtheria, cholera, and black plague. I don't want to walk down the street and see piles of of, of, uh, awful and, and, and excrement and open sewers running down the street. No, thank you. I am very thankful for the custodians. I am very thankful for the garbage men and the plumbers who keep the drains keeping, causing all that filth to flow away. <laughs> so I don't have to live in it. And my family doesn't have to live in it. Take pride. If you think about it, if you think about your job properly, you can think about how you are helping the entire world with your job. I told you I facilitate truck drivers picking up and delivering their loads. Who here has ever drank orange juice during the winter? 
that didn't come from the U.S., that came from South America. So thank a truck driver. <laughs> read, the, read the label. It'll say either around here, the labels normally say, made from concentrate from Florida slash Brazil. <laughs> because during part of the year, they get their source from up here. Part of the year, they get it from South America because they got a, you know, there's the supply. Without truck drivers, our society would be impossible. So I see that I am helping you have food on your table, clothes on your back, books to read, electronics that aid you in your life. If you think about your job, you know, food service jobs, I've worked those. I, had, I worked at Subway. You know, I knew um, a police officer, you know, that he, he told me one day, he said, hey, thanks. And I said, for what? I was just out of high school working at Subway. And he goes, I don't have time. I have to work long hours. I don't have time to prepare decent, wholesome food for myself. So thanks for preparing it for me at a reasonable price. If we think about it, whatever job we find ourselves in, we should be able to figure out how that we can, you know, we are serving God and others. Take pride in your labor. Realize you're doing a good thing. As long as you're not doing something where you're hurting people and taking advantage of people. I told, I've told my children, I told William, I said, William, because he said, I want to grow up and be just like you. And I said, you know what, son? What I want you to do is grow up to be the man that God wants you to be. If you grow up and you serve God, I don't care what kind of job you have. As long as you're honoring God and loving others, I will be proud of you. Let's stop talking bad about work when God made work part of creation. Let's stop complaining about having to labor. Let's get out of bed with some pride and some enthusiasm that we're doing a good thing. That we're helping God's plan for humanity. We're helping feed children and teach children and, and helping people protect themselves against the cold. Work is good. There's nothing wrong with climbing into your bed tired because you worked hard that day. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for everyone present. Lord, I pray that you help all of us understand that we're not meant to be takers, taking, 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 that we're meant to provide for ourselves and to help others as long as you have enabled us to do so. And that, Lord, that there are consequences for refusing to follow your plan. That when we refuse to follow that plan, that we destroy our own lives. And not only are we rendered unable to help others, but we can't even take care of ourselves. God, change the way we think about work. Teach us to view work the way you view work. Bless now, O Father. Work among us, I pray. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray all these things. Amen.